Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome. My name is Liz Martin. I'm the CEO of Accessible Arts. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, Accessible Arts is the peak arts and disability organisation in New South Wales. We advance the rights of and opportunities for people with disability or who are deaf to develop and sustain professional careers in the arts and have equitable access to arts and culture. Before we begin today's event, we'd like to warmly welcome Daniel McDonald to commence our event with a welcome to country. Well, hello everybody. I'm Daniel McDonald. I'm a proud deaf Aboriginal man. I come, uh, my pronouns are he and him. I come from a, a mob called the Woonwurra Land in the northwestern of New South Wales, the Hunter Valley um, region. I'm a member of the Sydney City Council Inclusion for Disability Advisory Panel, and I'm part of the First Peoples Disability Network Sydney, and a representative of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council Sydney. Today I welcome you here to the Gadigal land, Gadigal country. The domain is the land of the Gadigal people on the Eora Nation. I welcome and pay respects to all Aboriginal elders past and present and respectfully acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, brothers and sisters here today. We joyfully gather here today at this meeting place. It's only right that we honour the traditional owners of the land, the custodians of these lands and waters. Today, the 29th of June, 2023, we are at the Art Gallery of New South Wales for Accessible Arts, Access Ideas and Insights for the Future of Art. We're looking forward to hearing from the panel, Thea May Borman, Louise Jung, Amy Claire Mills, Aze, is that right? I hopefully got the names correct. <laughs> As we work out and discover what the future holds for us for accessible art. We will learn about their experiences, about thrilling tactile work, entire virtual exhibitions, with the fantastic possibilities of an inclusive future. On Gadigal land here today, we are confident, proud and an inclusive community. And doesn't matter who you are, and doesn't matter where you're from, we all don't know each other, but we are all inclusive and we respect each other. It's now time to come together share our ideas and insights, listen to our speakers and learn. It's now time to focus on the future of art. Accessible arts is for everyone. Remembering the past, respect, acknowledgement and love in the present. It's about inclusion. Understanding and hope for the future, the time is now. I hope you all have a beautiful day. And I'd like to say thank you for Accessible Arts, the staff for all their hard work for putting on this event today. Thank you for the interpreters. Thank you staff and everybody organising today. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thanks so much, Daniel, for that warm welcome. Uh, and welcome, everyone. It's so great to see everyone in the room and be here together today. And warm welcome to those of you who are beaming in from your homes and your offices and your spaces out there across the country. We have about 250 people in all attending today's event, so it's great that you can all make it um, and to hear from the artists. Before we move to the artists, though, there, we have a couple of special warm speakers. Um, firstly, I'd like to introduce Jackie Armstrong, who's the chairperson of Accessible Arts Board, to say a few warm wo words of welcome. Jackie Armstrong has extensive experience 
in the disability, government and health sectors, including positions with New South Wales and federal MPs and at KPMG in Sydney. Jackie has also served as National Policy Advisor for Guide Dogs Australia, where she's led strategy and engagement with gov government and industry bodies. Please join me in welcoming Jackie Armstrong. vertically challenged. Can you hear me with this in this position? Thank you, Liz. I would also like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Welcome to our third Access Ideas and Insights panel conversation of 2023, the third of our hybrid events where we have an in-person audience here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in this fabulous new space, as well as an accessible live stream broadcast delivered by our event partner, Pyrus. For more than 35 years, accessible arts has been a leading force within the New South Wales community, shaping, empowering and advancing the intersectionality of arts, culture and disability. In, in the last few, if the last few years have taught us anything, it's the importance of providing opportunities such as these that allow us to be together, be it online or in person, to connect with each other and discuss, share and consider how best we can work together to ensure an art sector that is authentically representative, diverse and accessible for everyone. I'm thrilled to be here and to hear from our panel of experts about the future of art and what it might hold for each of us. I'd like to thank our funding partners, Create New South Wales, City of Sydney for their support of this series, our donor circle for their ongoing support, our event partner, Pyrus, and our venue partners, Art Gallery of New South Wales, Museum of Contemporary Art, Sydney Opera House, and Bell Shakespeare. Thank you and welcome to this wonderful event. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, our next speaker this morning is beaming in the Honourable Kate Washington, New South Wales Minister for Disability Inclusion. Parliament is sitting this week and so the Minister has sent through the following video greeting us here to share now. Good morning everyone, I'm Kate Washington, the new Minister for Families and Communities and Disability Inclusion. Thank you so much for inviting me to join your event today and I'm really sorry I can't be with you in person as Parliament is sitting and I can't escape. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which you were meeting, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respect to Elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge Liz Martin, CEO of Accessible Arts, and her hardworking team for their work in hosting this exciting event and for championing people with disability in the arts. Can I say that this event and its purpose marries two great interests of mine, the arts and inclusion. I'm a passionate advocate and backer of the arts. The important role it plays in our lives and communities cannot be underestimated. For a long time, the arts has been perceived as a nice to have and accessible only to a few. Whereas in my view, the arts feeds our minds and souls. It's important to the health and well-being of all. So with that, the importance of ensuring making art, seeing art, enjoying art, and making a living out of art is accessible to all is so important. As the new Minister for Disability Inclusion, I'm really keen to support artists and audiences with disability to not only benefit as individuals, but to enrich our society. By ensuring diverse life experiences and stories are shared in galleries, on stages and screens, all of our worlds are expanded and people from all backgrounds with diverse disability experiences can see themselves reflected on stage and screen. It is the job of government and communities to ensure people with disability can live their lives to the fullest, accessing all spheres of life, from the sports fields to art galleries, stages to workplaces. And the Men's Labor government is committed 
to making New South Wales a leader in disability inclusion, taking a whole of government approach, representation in the arts, in government, at work in the community lies at the heart of inclusion. Our goal is to remove barriers, ensure accessibility and inclusion become the norm, not a nice to have. With that, I thank you all for your support of the arts, inclusion, enriching our lives and making our community stronger. And I wish you all a wonderful morning. I know where I'd prefer to be. I hope that I'll be able to join you in person next time. See you. Minister. Uh, okay, so we can move on to the panel now. Um, today we are joined by an expert panel of leading artists and technologists, Tia Bauman, Louise Zhang, and Amy Claire Mills, exploring the future of art, where we are now, what we've been working on, and what the future holds for creating truly accessible art. At the end of the panel, we will have some time for audience questions. For our online audience, these questions can be submitted via Slido, which is embedded in, to the right-hand side of your screen. For those using keyboard navigation, you will need to tab past the video controls to access this. There's a link there now, a QR code now, um, to, to uh, follow that. Alternatively, you may submit spoken questions or questions in Auslan by messaging them to the Accessible Arts Facebook page. For our audience in the room, you may request a microphone to ask questions. We have some roving microphones. Um, or by using Slido on your phone by navigating to slido.com and entering the code ARTS. That's double A-R-T-S. Please know that we have a wonderful full audience today, 250 people. So it may not be possible to get to every question, um, but we'll do our best. Now it's time to introduce our panel MC, Miranda Carroll, Director of Public Engagement here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Miranda is responsible for audience engagement and development across all divisions within public engagement, including learning and participation, public programs, education, families, access and community, visitor experience, web digital content and experience, marketing and communications, creative studio design and publishing. It's wonderful to have you with us this morning, Miranda. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Liz. Morning, everybody. I hope this, this mic is working now. Yes, it is. Um, and thank you, Liz, once again. Uh, welcome to today's panel conversation, The Future of Art. And I'd like uh, to um, join me in welcoming Tia, Tia Bauman. She's a creative executive artist, technologist and producer. She joined 4A Centre for Contemporary Asian Art as artistic director and chief executive officer in February 2023. From 2019 to 2022, she was Senior Manager of International Engagement at the Australia Council for the Arts, where she co-designed and led the launch of the International Engagement Strategy and provided oversight of strategic investments in Europe, North America and the Asia Pacific. Tia was CEO and founder of World First Hologram Brands Metaverse Makeovers, where she led the commercialization of augmented reality innovation with Metaverse Nails. <laughs> Today, we are also joined by Louise Zhang. Louise is a multidisciplinary artist whose practice spans painting, sculpture, and installation. Louise explores the dynamics of aesthetics, contrasting the attractive and repulsive in order to navigate the senses of fear, anxiety, and a sense of otherness reflecting her identity. Her work is inspired by horror cinema, Chinese mythology, and botany, adopting and placing symbols and motifs in compositions of harmonic dissonance. And finally, I would like to welcome Amy Claire Mills. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Amy. <laughs> Amy is an emerging disabled artist and curator. Her art practice explores identity and self-preservation through immersive installations and performance by which she becomes both the artist and subject. Her practice critiques and examines the politics surrounding disability experience. Amy is also the new arts development manager at Accessible Arts. So let's begin the conversation by inviting each of the panelists to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their creative practice with us. So Tia, let's start with you. Mm -hmm. You describe yourself as a creative executive, mm -hmm. artist, technologist, and producer. 
-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about your art practice and what specifically a technologist is? Sure. Okay, so I guess I have a bit of a hacker mentality when it comes to using technology. I am an artist, but also a technologist. And I guess you could describe a technologist as someone who can engineer and build things with tech. But I like to think of a technologist as someone who can um, make technology do what it hasn't originally been designed to do. Um, so one of the projects that I was involved in developing over many years um, was called Metaverse Nails. And essentially they're these holographic nails that you can wear. Um, and when you scan them with my game apps, my 3D apps, then customizable holograms fly out of your fingers that you can share to social media in real time. So what I describe this as, as a technologist, is that I worked in the space of femtech. So it was really designing technologies for um, non-binary and femme women of color. So it was really looking at technology designed by femmes for femmes. Um, and I guess my approach around that was really as a counter voice and a counter narrative to a lot of technology that is designed by white male tech bros, <laughs> um, which is <laughs> how I would describe myself as a technologist. I'm a femtech technologist and I use technology to do things that it hasn't originally been designed to do. Um, that's my I guess, definition of it. That's fabulous, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, Louise, you're a multidisciplinary artist with a practice that spans painting, sculpture, textiles and installation and digital art. Can you tell us about how you balance multiple art forms and mediums in your creative process? Thanks, Louise. Sometimes I wonder if I actually do <laughs> balance it. But um, what I do try to do is try. Um, so there are many ways of trying to, I guess, say what you want to say mm -hmm. through different mediums. And I find sometimes some mediums work better in doing that than others. So for example, with the sculptural works I make, I tend to think of how someone could feel when they look at something that's quite textured or visceral or tactile. And I want to elicit more of a bodily response to that. But then there are times where I'm trying to talk about a more specific narrative, something close to home, and I feel like a painting will do that better. So it's really, it really kind of depends on what I'm trying to say and how I like to say it. But ultimately, um, as of the last few years, it's really more about what I can do that my body is capable of handling. So there's a lot more explorations of working more digitally to be able to convey what I want to convey as opposed to the labor on my hands and my body in say painting. So yeah, many different factors. That's amazing Louise, thank you. Um, Amy, over to you. Your art practice recently has shifted to include sensory spaces and tactile experiences, as well as curating accessible exhibitions. Let's delve into what brought about this change and where you see this going in the future. Um, yeah, so I uh, had a very big shift during the pandemic with my art practice. So um, after I left art school, I did a lot of performance work and then the pandemic happened and that kind of all crashed. And I always loved textile work because I love the tactile nature. I love touching art. I love being kind of fully immersed in art. And I felt that that was kind of a natural progression from performance art, really, because I was creating sets and I was creating costumes. So I was always using tactile elements in my work. Um, and it kind of came also from, for me as a disabled woman, one of the safest spaces for me is my bedroom. And that's actually where I spend a lot of my time in my bed, um, in hospital beds. So the idea of art also being comfy drew me in, like being cuddly, being soft. And I talk about a lot of big 
topics in my art. I <laughs> talk about ableism a lot. And so I wanted a space. I wanted to create a space that was soft for people to kind of come into and feel supported that they could have the difficult conversations within. Um, because they are, they are kind of introspective conversations. And even within the disability community, you might have like internalized ableism. And I wanted a safe environment to explore those ideas. So sensory rooms and sensory spaces and tactile work kind of naturally progressed out of where I kind of started with art at art school. Um, yeah, is that answering the question? <laughs> I kind of blanked out what the question was. Um, but yeah, and then curating came kind of after the lovely Granville Centre Art Gallery, shout out, <laughs> um, uh, invited me to be a curator and that gave me a whole new platform to think about representation in the arts and how little um, disabled artists or curators or arts workers are actually represented across the arts sector. So that kind of gave me a whole new platform and insight into kind of this missing blank space that we seem to have in the arts. We seem to be like, oh, accessibility, yay, check. But we don't really think about do disabled people feel safe going into those spaces? Do they see themselves in those spaces? Do they trust those institutions? Because I mean, sure, I can get in the building, but do I see myself in the art at all? So that's, yeah, kind of how my practice is going right now. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. No, that's very pertinent. Um, so representation and accessibility are important aspects of art because they allow for greater inclusivity and understanding. With the increased accessibility of technology, collaboration and communication, the artistic expressions of traditionally underrepresented groups are becoming more visible. Because of this, many artists and institutions are now prioritizing representation and accessibility, leading to more transformative exhibitions and artworks. I'm gonna go back to you, Amy, on this one. Uh, let's start with you. You're a very passionate uh, person about disability representation. And last year, you curated the exhibition at Granville Center Art Gallery around disability experience. Can you tell us a little bit more about this exhibition and the need for greater representation and accessibility across the art sector? I know you just touched on yeah, that, yeah. but it would be great to elaborate on that. Um, I see representation and accessibility going hand in hand. You can't have one without the other, as I just mentioned. You can't have the building being fully accessible or the theatre space being fully accessible and not think that the disabled people are just going to be like, oh, thank you so much. This is so great. We need to see ourselves represented in the art. We need to be a part of the art. We need to be making the art. Our stories need to be told. And, you know, when I go to exhibitions, when I go to the Biennale, when I go to the National, when I see things that don't have my stories, I'm like, what's, what's happening here? Where's the gap? You've made it accessible. That's great. But I can't trust this institution because it doesn't represent me. It doesn't have anyone who looks like me or who has my experience. Um, and so um, that's always a big passion point of mine. I think, I almost think representation comes before accessibility. I know that's controversial, but if I'm curated into a show or if I'm curating a show, then I'm going to bring accessibility with me, right? So I'm going to say, these are my accessibility needs and this is the audience that I want to reach. And so I'm going to bring those accessibility like needs along with me. So it almost, I say it's chicken the egg, but you can't have a great, accessible, beautiful institution and not have representation. Anyways, Granville was amazing because I think I've, I, there have been um, shows with disabled artists and there have been shows that are about disability experience. I'm not saying there haven't been, but Granville was great because the team came to me and said, we want you as the curator. We want you to find the artists. We want you to tell the stories. Like, how can we reach these audiences? How can we make it an inclusive amazing show and like one of the big things for me about that show was I curated um, a friend of mine uh, Bailey Lobb into the show and she makes um, accessible installations so she makes these giant um, 
inflatable sculptures that are mobility friendly. So you can go in there in your mobility scooter or you can go in there in your wheelchair. And that was just, she found that that was just something that was like kind of blanked when we were thinking about, um, you know, installations. And, you know, the Granville team, I, I love them, sorry. I keep like shouting out, but they were so good because I came to them and I was like, I want audio descriptions. I want the exhibition to be online. I want Auslan tours. I want tactile tours. And they were like, yeah, let's do it, <laughs> which is awesome. And like, that's how it should be. You shouldn't have to fight institutions to say you want to reach these audiences. I mean, something that is so ingrained in accessible arts is that uh, like the disabled community, we really trust the arts. We really love the arts. We go to all the shows and we go to the museum. Actually, I think, I don't know the statistic, Liz, um, <laughs> but I think it's actually disabled audiences actually go above non-disabled audiences to art institutions because this is a safe space for us, but how can we make it that next level? Sorry, that was rambling. <laughs> Not at all, not at all. <laughs> yeah, let's! <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Um, so speaking of accessibility within institutions, 4A Gallery is doing very interesting um, things in the digital space. Um, Tia, can you tell us a bit more about 4A Digital, mm -hmm. how it's supporting artists to explore new virtual realms, and how does this intersect with making exhibitions more accessible? Sure. Um, I guess, so we have a series of platforms at 4A, um, the first one being 4A Digital, and it really stemmed out of um, a pivot to the online space during COVID. So everyone was doing it. Our gallery got, I guess, closed down during COVID, so um, no one could go into the physical um, institution and the art centre. So we pivoted very, very quickly to the online space and commissioned a range of Asian Australian artists um, to create digital works of, of various descriptions. So there was an augmented reality filter, um, there was immersive works, um, there was like net art works. Um, so it was a quite a broad range of digital works that we were commissioning but we also have another new platform which we're launching, which is called 4AI. Mm. And it's looking at um, the cultural advancement of artificial intelligence um, and how AI intersects with art um, and specifically art of the Asian diaspora. So this is a new development with 4A. Um, it's really looking at um, advances in emerging technologies mm. and trying to make it as accessible as possible um, and interlinking it with Asian diasporic practice, which is what we do. So that's <laughs> one of the projects that we're developing is with an Indian collective called Elsewhere in India. And the idea is that we will open up some um, collections of Indian art objects and antiquities that are stored in collections here in Australia. And they will use artificial intelligence to digitize um, the collections mm -hmm. and therefore make it more accessible in um, 4A as a virtual museum. So it's basically reclaiming art objects, um, digitizing them with algorithms, and digital AI technologies, and then trying to make it as accessible as possible to audiences that might not be able to access them um, here in Australia and also internationally. Fantastic. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Louise, um, as an artist with an expansive career, what role do you think art institutions and museums play in, in making art more accessible to diverse communities? I think um, art institutions and museums play a quite a crucial role in capturing our history, capturing our society's um, past, present, future. However, I feel like there's been what's been presented to us when we go to these kind of institutions is still quite intimidating. Um, there's still a version of that, I guess, 
capturing that history that is still quite sanitized, um, colonialized. And I think as time progresses on, that we need to kind of push for more equitable representation within these spaces because that is a reflection of life. That's a re reflection of reality that we're all in. And so by working with communities, working with people uh, like us, <laughs> having these kind of events on, I think that is a pro like a step forward for sure. But what I would really love to see is um, less so like, Frankly, I'm so glad I am here to be with you guys here, but I love this to be the norm when we enter a gallery space as well. And that's what's like, you can't have a institution um, that is for diversity and for representation if you don't have those things within the actual institution. So more, more of that, please. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. Um, so the title of today's panel is The Future of Art. We're going through a huge cultural shift in the arts with the rise of AI and augmented reality. Let's explore how this technology can be used to make art practices and exhibitions more accessible. So Tia, back to you. Within your art practice, you've used augmented reality for Metaverse Nails. And with the rise of virtual and augmented reality, what impact do you think this will have on the traditional gallery and exhibition experience? Right, so I don't think it's a, it'll supplant the traditional gallery experience. Um, it'll augment the gallery experience. So using new technologies is a way of um, creating new types of interactive moments with art. Um, it's about creating new types of immersion with the art. Um, and new connections with the art. Um, I don't think it'll ever really take over the, the traditional kind of gallery in-person experience, but it's another way of experiencing the artwork potentially through a mobile device, which so many of us have, um, and creating those other points of engagement with the artwork. Um, and I think that's really, really Im important to kind of democratise um, the art experience and doing that through technology is um, really what the future of art should be about. Um, you know, creating those access points um, online, but also within the physical gallery space. And you can look at new technologies to do that, um, whether augmenting it with augmented reality and offering new types of content to accompany that artwork, whether it flies out of the artwork, whether it's, um, you know, different types of conversations that can be experienced through AR, sonically or visually. Um, and then there's also the virtual reality aspect, which is, um, you know, kind of experiencing that virtual artwork within a virtual realm, um, maybe in a game. So transporting the art into a gaming construct um, or experiencing it in the metaverse, which is the kind of hot thing at the moment. It's kind of a bit of a um, well-trodden point of discussion when it comes to new technologies. But essentially, I, I am a, a true believer of the metaverse as being a, a space that is open and accessible to all um, if it is designed with a plurality of voices from the get-go, which hopefully we can all contribute to that design of what the metaverse could and should be, which is open, um, accessible, diverse voices, a plurality of voices, um, and easily accessible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's talk about accessible tech, Louise. Um, within your practice, when you're creating artworks, do you use any adaptive tech to support you in the production phase? And where do you see accessible tech evolving in the future? Um, I do. I'm a, I've always been a very advert drawer. I love drawing so much and making work. And um, as time has gone on, I realize my body cannot handle the same load and enthusiasm <laughs> as it used to. So my hands are kind of degrading on me. Um, and so I 
shifted from using pencil and paper and drawing more detailed things to simplifying and getting the essence of what I would like to create, so far, like simpler lines. Um, but then beyond that, when I would like to do something a bit more thought out um, and plan that ahead, I use the iPad. I know it's just an iPad, but it's been such an asset for me to be able to um, get the things down and then be able to kind of compartmentalize what I can start with and what to do when I want to say do a painting, what I can just go in and be like, oh, okay, I'm not going to just spend three hours working on this thing when I can spend uh, 20 minutes on this thing and save my hands so I can paint it. Um, so that's my experience of using um, adaptive tech. In terms of the future, um, I'm not too sure. I mean, I feel like I read somewhere that by 2025, tech will be like, living with tech would be the norm in a way that is quite remarkable compared to what we are living in now. I'm both honestly quite excited, but also like terrified at the same time. Too many movies, perhaps. Um, <laughs> the, when are the robots coming, right? Um, but while I'm really excited, I, I like to think of the more positive notes because maybe I think there's just too many sad things in life. Um, and that is uh, improving quality of life. And that can mean many different things, like from a medical aspect to, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, an advanced iPad where I can like control the stylus with my mind or something. <laughs> you know, there are all these kind of things out there that I'm really excited to be able to do what I love, do what we all love, but in a way that our bodies can work with. Yeah. Amazing. Um, Amy, you're a textile artist and I assume create a lot of your artworks by hand. How can the art world balance preserving traditional art forms with embracing new media and technology? Um, yeah, I'd go with Tia and Louise. I don't think it's like uh, us versus them. Do you know what I mean? Like I, my art kind of falls under, I call it craftivism or, well, it's called craftivism. I'm not saying that right. Sorry. Um, so it kind of falls under the the kind of traditional medium of craft, which really values the handmade. It really values the artist interaction into the art. And then you move into the kind of art sphere and that kind of more values the concept of art. It doesn't really matter how you make it. It's kind of, if you can kind of, sorry, I'm saying kind of a lot. If you can put your art it, put your ideas out there, then that's what's valued. And so my aunt tries to mesh the two together, but like Louise, my, it, my art is very physical. Making textile pieces is very physical and I put my body under way too much stress. And so I would like, yeah, I don't what, What's the question? Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> blanking out everyone okay no so it was about it, yep. well, really what I, I was asking was um how can we we all love me in this audience it's fine <laughs> how can we preserve traditional art forms oh okay while, uh, while embracing new technology yeah so as i said i don't think it's a there's no battle no. i don't think artists see it as a battle i see it as yeah will technology kind of adapt to help us out mm. and that still values the handmade but i don't think yeah i don't think the handmade will ever disappear disappear completely because if you look at something like crochet right crochet you can never recreate that with a machine it can only be created by hand so all the crochet things you see out there, they're actually knit. Uh, they're not crochet. <laughs> and so like, I don't think that'll ever die away, but I think there's just ways that we can kind of like um, value the artist and their ideas and how much effort, I mean, how much effort goes into just thinking up a concept um, and the materialities, thinking about the materialities and how you make. So I don't think like, I don't know whether I like the word traditional anyways. I just think the handmade will never leave, but how can we take the handmade into maybe augmented realities? Like, can we teach people to like crochet in the metaverse? Like that would be really cool. Can we create crocheted outfits in the metaverse? Like um, I made a quilt that had a, um, 
a QR code in it. So you could scan the, the QR code on the quilt and then it would take you to an app um, on Instagram, like a filter on Instagram. So there's like ways that you can bring the old with the new and it still be a really fun experience. I think it's more about making art a bit more like adaptive and fun, but it's not about these people are old because they handmade and these people are the new wave because they're using AI. I think it's like, how do we bridge the gap? That's more the question. It's less like um, one or the other as opposed to expanding the field of what we can do. Yeah, mm. yeah. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, I'm sorry. Well, thank you very much. That was really helpful. Um, this completes our formal questions to the panel. Um, so I'd now like to open up the conversation to the audience. Uh, we're using the Slido question platform for the first time at this event. Um, and I'm just waiting for the iPad so that I can read out the questions. Thank you, Danielle. Very kind. Thank you very much. Okay, I have a question here from M. Sunflower. Um, nice to hear from you. There Are there inherent issues of trust, privacy and exploitation when using billionaire created tech, using the metaverse and similar as a marginalized community? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> to be pretty blunt, absolutely, that is a real fear um, and risk and, and threat to um, original creation, to um, the voices of diverse communities. Um, I mean, just with appropriation generally of artist styles, um, the machine can do it in a way which is um, pretty extractive. <laughs> um, I think there is a real, a real issue around um, Big, big tech um, kind of uh, exploiting um, artists' work and, and creators' work. Mm. And I think that's a, definitely a conversation that more people need to be having. Um, it's a really, really great question and it's a really um, real concern. And I think um, just having a multiplicity of voices at the table um, whilst this new technology is being built and being engineered is really, really essential. Um, it's very topical um, and it is a real threat. Yeah. Anyone else want to comment? Uh, I think you answered that perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, VR has been used as an excuse not to build access into IRL. Um, is a VR, i.e. a VR to a waterfall track instead of a ramp and touching the water. Is this a risk in the art space? I'll answer that. Yes. <laughs> um, it's not a, you, when you're designing an exhibition, you have to make it accessible, but the online platform doesn't mean that you take away uh, accessibility from the physical space. They need both to happen. You need the ramp in the virtual world because if we create avatars, you know, if I'm a disabled woman going into the virtual space, I'm not going to suddenly make myself non-disabled. <laughs> like, this is, I'm identity first. This is who I am. And so, like, if I was a wheelchair user, I might want to use a wheelchair in the virtual space as well. Like, we shouldn't think that the virtual space will erase everything. And we shouldn't just say, I've got so many examples of um, spaces throughout life at university um, where they would say, okay, well, the lift's broken, but we've got this buzzer downstairs. And so if you can't use the lift to get to the library, just use this buzzer and this person will come down and get the books for you. Well, that means that I can't go up to the library and enjoy the library space. It's not just about the books, it's about being in the space as well. And so like, you can't just say, oh, this is online, great, it's perfect online and not think, that I might want to come into the physical space and experience that with my friends, my family, my colleagues. Like that is like excluding people from the experience and that's so unfair and uncool. Did that answer? Sorry, I keep saying that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? 
Um, I think the, the virtual space has been quite an asset for someone like me with um, mad social anxiety. I don't think you can tell, right? Um, <laughs> and so it's allowed me to kind of uh, see things and experience things, um, experience to a level uh, where other ways, like I wouldn't be able to attend something, say, if I caused brain. Um, so I can attend it and still enjoy it and be experience it through the virtual space. So it has been an asset to me. However, I do think sometimes that the virtual space is used as a bit of a, a cop-out tool, a controversial, sorry, um, to just be like, yes, we've ticked the boxes for accessibility and disability because we've got a digital platform and then that's it. But the truth is that's not gonna work for everyone. Um, and things like accessibility isn't just one thing. It's actually a multitude of many, many different things. And so we have to consider all those different things. We're not just like living at home and then that's the rest of our life. We wanna go out. That's why I'm here trying to face my fears. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's important to kind of have many different, like we, it's important to have both. It's not just one. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, I don't have any more questions on here. Is that right? Or do we want to have any questions from the audience? Oh, we've got a question up the back there. Thank you so much um, for the chat so far. Um, my name's Jess. Um, I was just wondering, you know, there's a really good comment and I can't remember who made it now about, you know, I think it was you, Louise, you know, we want this to be the norm. And so it got me thinking, um, like, if you were to have a rider and we were to ex expect all the kind of um, normal, let's say, accessibility things. What are the things that come like for you that you would be have on your rider as your non-negotiables that we can like as arts workers take back to our arts organisations and make normal? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't think I'm honestly quite qualified to be able to um, answer that. But for me personally, um, like I've had to kind of consider my trip down here, um, like plan it quite thoroughly to be able to come here. I may not look like, you know, whatever, but um, it is a, a big task for me to enter this kind of space. And so I've always worked in a way where I'm the one who's like trying to think of ways to make it comfortable for me to get here and um, experience the space as is. However, I can do that. Not all of us can do that. And that's me also working with things that haven't changed. So if we have that change, I don't have to think about that stuff. I can enjoy it like everyone else. Um, but in terms of the specifics, I don't think I'm qualified. <laughs> but perhaps. <laughs> um, I mean, an access rider is for yourself. So it's, it's if I go into a space, it's my accessibility needs. I can't talk for the whole of disability spectrum. It's a very vast spectrum. And lots of, like, it's hard to say, but lots of accessibility needs actually clash. I think what organisations need to do is have um, kind of inclusive um, advisory groups. Like that's, I mean, it's best practice to pay people to be on these advisory groups. Um, even if you just do it in like short bursts, if you want kind of that kind of, insight and knowledge if you can't have it on an ongoing basis because I know there's not enough funding in the arts. Um, but that way, then you can get a diverse range of voices across the disability spectrum and they will tell you um, what's best practice for them and their disability. Um, I can only speak for mine. I mean, I've worked as an access co coordinator in um, my jobs and so I've learnt a lot from my peers but I would not say that I'm the best person to speak for someone who is deaf or hard of hearing. I don't know Auslan, it's not my language and so I would want someone who is deaf or hard of hearing to come in and speak to that lived experience. Um, I can learn from them but I'm not them. So yeah, I think it's about making sure that you if you are inviting someone who is disabled, making sure that, yeah, they do have an access rider and um, actually actioning what is in their access riders, because it's not just like, oh yeah, we've got that, but we're not gonna listen 
to anything that's written on the piece of paper or change anything or adapt anything. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely that, but it's definitely also like training, like go to Accessible Arts and get some training from <laughs> us. Um, like, so everyone in your organisation becomes a better ally. That's really important as well. Like, it's not just, it's kind of exhausting being disabled and being like, please, please, please. Um, it's, I want allies along with me. I want the non-disabled community to come along with me and be partnered with me to make spaces more accessible. Yeah, I can't walk too much, so more seats would be nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is it like just me or is there just not enough seats in galleries? <laughs> there is definitely not enough seats yeah. in galleries. <laughs> We've got some claps. <laughs> Anybody else in the audience? Yep. Um, hello. Yeah. Um, so, is there any accessible accessibility consultancy firms or anything that anybody knows of, rather than just leaving it up to individual organisations, but actually have a consultancy firm that would take on that role and obviously gain a lot of experience and do it on a contract basis. Does anybody know of anything like that? Or I mean, there, there definitely are um, the lovely Moana, who used to be the CEO um, of Accessible Arts, has a consultancy firm. Um, so they, they are out there. Um, Accessible Arts is a consultancy as well. <laughs> like, we're here. Um, there are. And it's good to hire them to come in and kind of do that training and stuff like that. But it's also just about giving artists a form of income and a platform to feel like they're going along as part of the journey. So um, back when the new building was being um, kind of designed and stuff, I was on an access and inclusion panel about best practice for the new building, about how to make it accessible um, for the Art Gallery of New South Wales. So, and that was all made up of artists as well. So that was really great. So it can be done and, you know, we get paid for it because <laughs> sometimes that doesn't pay. <laughs> Um, thank you guys so much for this fantastic conversation. My name's Kyle. I'm actually a queer uh, disabled film producer. And I wanted to ask you guys within networking and spaces like that and using emerging technologies, um, as artists, as creators, we're not creating stuff in a silo. We're always networking. I wanted to ask you guys how you're using emerging technologies, AI, the metaverse, and things like that to be able to help support and help find ways of connecting people to artists or connecting people to producers or connect people to the industry who might be new, who might not know where to turn to and things like that? Um, I was once told about this story where uh, that someone went to say um, a grad show at art school and they really loved this artist and they really wanted to exhibit them in the commercial gallery. That's a big deal for us. Um, However, they couldn't find any information about this person aside from and there. And so one of the things I learned was to always just keep, it's quite simple, keep things updated online because people can't always make it to say your exhibition, but they can access the documentation of that. And so I often kind of think that as important as the experience of an exhibition is um, and having an exhibition in the space, the documentation is what lasts and that's the documentation is what reaches people. And so for me, uh, putting my stuff online, keeping it updated, but also social media uh, has really allowed me to go beyond mm -hmm. um, my comfort zones and being able to achieve more than I could possibly think I could have achieved by now. Um, the only downside of social media though is um, what are those like big tech billionaire people? Yeah, I think they're ruining it for us. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for me, that's what's really helped me in that aspect. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say the power of the DM is <laughs> really potent, actually. You can create some pretty wild connections and collaborations just by reaching out to artists that you might not know in person, but um, just putting it out there on Instagram and just saying, hey, I'd lo love to collaborate um, can really create some 
new opportunities for you as as a filmmaker working in that space? I mean, I, I I've curated exhibitions just purely through the power of like a DM um, and have worked with some amazing international artists with like quite significant profiles. So I think just kind of losing the fear of putting it out there is the kind of first step. Um, and then you can really have some amazing conversations just on Instagram. Um, yeah. Yeah, social media is very powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say with the disabled community, um, there's a lot of, we're online a lot. We're online a lot because we can't always get to the physical space. So there's great connections that can be made and great advocacy that's actually happening online, which I think is such a powerful tool that we maybe didn't have before. Um, it's like the collective voice is out there now, you know, you can't like hide away. You can't say I've never heard it because we're out there. Um, so yeah, social media is pretty powerful. It's it's got its downfall as well. It's kind of crappy. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> um, well, we can't have it all. Yeah, but I think it's quite a powerful tool. Um, and yeah, I think it's. I would say the DM is really good as well. It kind of takes away that kind of formalness, which sometimes I think can. I don't know, hinder you a little bit because you think, oh, I've got to be, the spelling's got to be great. The grammar's got to be great. I've got to say the right thing in an email. But sometimes like the cheeky DM, it works. It really does work. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, I think there's something on. There is something on here, I know. but I think <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you this morning. Um, I think it's more of an observation than a question. I think, I sincerely hope that in the future of art for, from disabled folks is that I could come to a panel like this and hear what excites you, what the historical provenance of your work is, um, what you're currently working on and what's exciting about your future work rather than um, having to advocate, because I feel like sometimes advocacy is a full-time job alongside the practice and that I'll come to a panel and hear about the work rather than the access point. Yeah. I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I honestly felt quite, um, initially it took me a while to uh, agree to be part of the panel because I just didn't feel like I fitted into the crowd to be honest and which is completely silly I know um, but it I kind of got wrapped up in my head about how I'm going to talk about these things and things like advocacy and stuff like that um, played a big role in kind of like how I would present myself but in the end I realized I can only speak for what I know and of my experiences um, and so I hope that we can have more talks around our experiences and the type of art we make and stuff, regardless of what we, who we are. Yeah. I agree. I would say my art's app wrapped up with advocacy, so <laughs> it's hard to separate them. Um, but yeah, I love, I love to talk about my art. Ask me about my art, I love it. Um, but yeah, I would say it's hard to separate myself. I've kind of wrapped myself up in a nice neat bow and I'm going to protest and I'm going to advocate and I'm going to make spaces better for my community because that's what I'm passionate about and that comes out through my art. In saying that though, <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I, it's, it's, I didn't have a conversation not long ago just here actually about how um, often when uh, you are a person of colour working in the arts space. Um, they love your work, you use a lot of colours, whatever. But there's still going to be so much interest in around who you are, um, your story and things like that. And sometimes we get quite exhausted to having to relay every single detail, where my family's from, was I born in Australia, all these kind of things. But sometimes I just want to be like, 
I made this artwork and this is what it's about, mm -hmm. rather than like, yes, my, my dad immigrated here from like the 80s and you know, it's a regurgitation of my lived experience that I feel like I don't have to regurgitate. I mean, yes, I did though make a quilt that said what's wrong with you <laughs> when I get lots of questions about what's wrong with me. That's probably the most, um, like I'll say I'm disabled and people will be like, hmm, no, no, this doesn't compute. What's wrong with you? And then I have to like, you know, it depends on what I'm feeling the day, whether I advocate for myself and be like, well, that's really inappropriate for you to ask. Or I go, well, let me tell you my trauma story. All right, it started when I was born. Um, it's your decision. Yes, right? it is yeah. my decision. But it can be exhausting. And I think I made that art piece because I was like, this is how exhausting it is. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of wanted to, you know, kind of... I don't know, just kind of show, have a physical representation of how exhausting it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I can definitely weigh into the whole kind of labour of representation. <laughs> like, um, I, I tick boxes. So I, <laughs> you know, I'm like a woman of colour, queer, um, first generation Australian, um, working in tech, as a woman, like, you know, I, I have to kind of carry all of this additional labor of representation, which can be incredibly exhausting. So, you know, it's wonderful to ooh, have the invitation to come and talk to these at these sorts of um, at these sorts of platforms. I think it's really important to talk about it. Um, but yeah, also just be aware that, you know, we, we are diversity comes with its own kind of baggage of representation. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I do have one more um, question online uh, from Amanda. Who are some Australian artists who identify as disabled that you are each excited by and why? I don't know who wants to take that one first. <laughs> <laughs> this is the emotional labour we were talking about. Yeah. Um, I want to shout out to Casula Powerhouse and my two friends over here, Andrea and Dylan, have got a show opening up on the 1st of July, which is all, um, it's by Creative Hybrids Lab. It's all about um, artists who have had organ donation or transplantation. And yeah, it's amazing. And everyone in the collective is a trans transplanted artist. I don't know what we call, what do you say? Transplant artist? Yeah, yeah sure. Great. They're going with that. <laughs> um, but you should definitely go check that out. What's it called? Paradoxes of Paradise. Paradoxes of Paradise. And it's a Kisula Art Centre for a month. Oh, so t until online until September the 24th for those online. Um, yeah, that's a really great show and I'm really excited to see the work there. Um, and that's International and Australian Artists Collective. Um, so yeah, go and check that out. <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> um, there's heaps of Australian artists um, with disabilities and yeah, Google it. Like, I'm sorry, but like, do your work, do the research, um, find these artists for yourself. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I can name people, but I think that it's important that you find these people for yourself. I think it's important that you seek these people out. I think it's, you know, like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Google it. <laughs> um, I was really stoked to be able to see that Amy was on this panel because when we were invited we didn't know who was going to be on the panel yeah um and I was really stoked to have Amy <laughs> because I've um I'm like it's not like we're BFFs but we could be we could be, we could be. Yeah. we're gonna be um, <laughs> but I've seen Amy around we went to the same art school and um love her work of course but uh as someone who is still kind of like a bit unsure about um being a part of the community um Amy kind of helps me. Amy kind of doesn't like give a shit, to be honest. And that's like exactly what I need as well. And a lot of us need, especially if we feel as though we don't quite belong. Um, and so her advocacy does help. 
Disability representation is very difficult because uh, there's people who were born with disabilities like myself and you've had to advocate for yourself since birth. And then there's people who become disabled um, later in life and that's a new journey from them and I can't speak to that experience at all. And coming into the disabled space and, and not knowing your place and having questioned yourself and there's like a lot of internalised ableism. Am I supposed to be here? Is this a safe space? Will I get charged if I say that I'm part of the community. I would say it's a loving, beautiful, inclusive community and we want you all. <laughs> Especially you, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Thank you. laughs> yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have any more on here. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions from the audience. Oh, we've got one more. Yes, we do. Hi, um, I'm Ebony. Nice to meet you all. Um, I just had a question uh, really to ask for some advice and your perspective on this. So obviously, as people with disability, we always have to advocate for ourselves, unfortunately. Um, and that is oftentimes with the people who are employing us. And so when you're trying to navigate those difficult conversations with places like the Art Gallery of New South Wales or other big institutions or maybe archaic institutions or places that have done things the way they've always done them and getting them to change is super hard. How do you have those difficult conversations but still take into context the fact that maybe if you say the wrong thing, you won't get to be on the next panel. <sighs> that, yeah, that's, that's, it's very difficult experience. And I think that we can speak from disability experience, but any minority group would feel kind of the same. If you say the wrong thing, if you're angry, if you're too loud, if you upset someone, you're never going to be asked back into that space. I would say that Yes, that is hard, but don't censor yourself. What you're saying is important and your anger or fear or frustration is very important. Um, I would just say that it won't be the only panel or it won't be the only institution that asks you. You know, your voice is important. As artists, all our voices are important and we speak to the cultural and historical landscape that's happening in Australia and beyond and yeah, I would say that maybe it might suck, but walk away from that institution. If they're not ready to open up and be adaptive and have that conversation, then they're not ready to have your shining light there. I would say walk away. Uh, I can talk to this as, as an employer, actually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm the artistic director and CEO for a Centre for Contemporary Asian Art, and we have, a I think, a core team of about eight. Um, and I think it's really important um, in a leadership position is to support vulnerability um, and to encourage those sorts of conversations. So I think that it's very, very real. No one is kind of superhuman in an organisation and kind of can do all the things and be all the things. But I think just um, being embracing of, of being vulnerable and having those sorts of conversations is really, really important and kind of leading that um, those sorts of conversations as well. So, yeah, I think that's my sort of standpoint on that. Yeah. I do have one more question here. Um, it's again from M Sunflower. Um, how do you include PTSD and triggers in your access rider without alienating or adversely affecting the galleries you're working with? Kind of a tail on from the last question, really. Yeah, I... What? To be honest, I haven't had to put any kind of trigger warnings on any of the content that we've shown it for a yet. Um, but I think just being conscious of it. I think I had a conversation with some really wonderful women in this um, somewhere sitting here. Um, um, we were talking about um, a virtual reality experience that actually created a kind of out of body experience that was actually a little bit existentially fraught. Mm. Um, and the clearly, you know, some people reacted to that as an out of body experience and potentially might have felt a bit of nausea. 
And I don't think those sorts of things are being kind of taken into consideration when it comes to these deeply immersive experiences. You know, the content could be quite vanilla, actually, like floating through space, but some people might react to that as completely vertigo-inducing. Um, and I think it's just having those kind of like basic trigger warnings, like, hey, you might actually have an existential meltdown <laughs> if you experience this work, is, is important. Um, and just being conscious that not everyone reacts to um, technologies in the, in the same way. Yep. How are we doing for time, Liz? One very short question. There's one more question. Are there any more questions in the audience or? We can wrap it up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much to our panelists for the wonderful conversation um, and for uh, sharing your experiences. And um, I want to know more about your art practice now, uh, what your future ideas are and what you're going to be up to. So um, I'll be cornering you in a moment. Um, if anyone else wants to hear, you can gather around. Um, and if you're at home, I'll email you later on this morning. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's so good to get together and tease out some of this stuff and have these kind of conversations. So a huge heartfelt thank you to everyone on the panel and to, for, to Miranda for steering the conversation so beautifully. Um, thank you to everyone in the room and at home for your questions and your curiosity in this space and sharing your knowledge as well. It's much appreciated. Um, we're doing this again in September. We'd love to see you there. So on the 19th of September, We'll be um, heading down to Piers 2-3, Bell Shakespeare's The Seed. Um, I reckon maybe we're trackies for that one. Um, we're going to be in the rehearsal space. Um, and it will be a conversation about how to boost audiences. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be vital for you to come along and hear the next conversation. In the meantime, if you want to uh, expand your knowledge, you might want to um, sign up for uh, a special promo offer we have at Accessible Arts, which is our next training session of Accessible Exhibition Design. If you log in, first six places get 20% off. Um, that's for Wednesday the 6th of September or Wednesday the 22nd of November. All you need to do is type in the promo code FUTURE. Okay. Um, what else? Oh, we'd love to hear your feedback. You're going to see a promo, a little, uh, there we go. Technology and future is here. So there's a QR code popped up now. All you have to do is swipe that. You'll see it at home as well. Swipe it. Tell us what you think, what you want to know about next. We'd love to hear. Um, and thanks so much for today. Uh, I'd just like to invite Danielle to Danielle Galotta, who is a major um, partner and support from Art Gallery of New South Wales, just to say a few words to finish off. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. So on behalf of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, either in person or online. I want to thank the generous sharing of their lived experiences by our panellists today for their frank and honest responses. Thank you also to Miranda Carroll for making this time available to share her time with us and also listen to the voices of our disability and arts audiences. Today, I also want to thank and acknowledge the contribution this morning of Jackie Armstrong for her words this morning, the Accessible Arts Chairperson, as well as the very generous welcome by Daniel MacDonald. Thank you. I also want to thank and acknowledge our Auslan interpreters for today. So we've had Isabella Haig, Alyssa Haig, and we also had Belinda Dagger. This series of Access Ideas and Insights has only been made possible because of our project partners. So today I want to acknowledge the support of Create New South Wales, the City of Sydney, Pyrus, and of course to my colleagues here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. So our AV team, our VX team, our catering team as well.
I also want to acknowledge the support today of Marissa Pazisnik Ross and Jessica Chu, who were both graduates from, from an accessible arts uh, program internship, as well as being accessible arts advisors. For the people in the gallery today, I really encourage you to take the opportunity to explore our expanded campus and take up all the experiences that this new building has to offer. So from me, I'd like to again thank you and welcome you back again. Thank you all. Thank you.